We're going to call the uh, Judiciary A um, hearing to order. I want to first say thank you to the committee members for being here. I think we have a couple on Zoom. Carl, we have Senator Boyd on Zoom. Um, hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving, and it's good to good to be back. Um, we have a couple things for this meeting, and you have the agenda in front of you along with a packet of materials. And what we're going to do, we're going to go over the first. We have three presenters uh, for the first topic, which is uh, NamUs National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. Just a little bit of background. I hope and I think everybody will find this interesting. Um, I also think that it's something that people in this state don't realize uh, goes on, but it's something that is important to our, our citizens, our prosecutors, our judges, our law enforcement. Um, and as you'll see in the packet and you'll hear from the presenters, um, states are presenting and passing legislation to address this issue, which is why I wanted to bring it up. Um, <clears throat> I will also note that, and put to your attention, there is a book that came out called uh, The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist. And it details what I call the systemic issues in our forensics area. I see some people nodding their head if you've read it. It's really kind of interesting. Um, and so, what we're going to hear from our uh, Lieutenant Darren Versaija from Pascagoula Police Department. And Lieutenant Versaija has really become, in my opinion, a the foremost authority in the state of Mississippi on solving cold cases. And I think you're going to see that. Um, and he's worked uh, a lot in this field and really for a couple of years has talked to me about this. Then we're going to hear from... Um, Dr. Holobinko, the state anthropologist. I won't take a test to see if y'all knew that we had a state anthropologist, <laughs> but we do, who's under the ME's office, and Sheriff Troy Peterson from Harrison County. They have uh, what I call loosely come together to try to address this issue in the state, and I appreciate their work. So um, it's it's been really good, and what I think is going to be best is we'll hear from the presenters and then we'll open it up to questions from the committee. So, and we're going to allow, uh, we do have one other matter on the, on the agenda, just a, a short issue related to judicial redistricting, but I, it's my intent to keep this to an hour, hour and 20 minutes at the most. And so we're going to start with Darren. So Lieutenant Versaja, and I'll say this to the presenters, if you would give your background when you get up to present, just give your background and, and uh, where you, what your work is and how you got into this. And we'll hear from you. So Lieutenant Versage, it's all yours. All right, again, I'm uh, Lieutenant Darren Versage and I am with the Pasco Police Department. I have, uh, most of my career has been in investigations um, I started my career in 1992 as a regular patrolman, and by 1994, I was an investigator. And I stayed in that up until 2014 when I took a promotion for sergeant, and then 2016, promotion for lieutenant, which took me out of the investigative role. But part of that, I worked with the FBI task force in reference to uh, their safe streets. Um, and, uh, you know, I gained a lot of knowledge in that. And then I went to work for the district attorney's office as a criminal investigator, which at that point, I really learned how to be a, a, a true policeman. I learned uh, a lot about the laws and, and, and what needed to be done. And I also started working cold cases around 1996, but not as a full-time thing. I, I got into that more in the DA's office. And then in 2010, we had a news article come out about how many cold cases were in each jurisdiction. And I thought, hmm, well, I wonder how many Pascagoula has. Well, we had 26. <clears throat> and uh, that took me back because we only have about 30,000 population in Pascagoula and we had 26 unsolved homicides. And to me, that was a lot for such a small 
area, small population. And so that got me studying this. And unfortunately, when I get into something in my head, I, I, I take it all the way as far as it will go and then some. And that's exactly what I did with this, uh, this case. I can remember giving my, uh, my captain saying, look how far y'all want me to go with this. And they went, you go to the end. So here I am still trying to, to reach that end. So in doing that, I uh, uncovered all kinds of different things. I figured that the way to work cold cases um, would be to find out everybody that had been arrested or been in some kind of um, trouble um, with law enforcement from the earliest case we had, which was 1975. And then I looked at everybody that had been arrested and we ended up finding Sam Little, who was the most notorious serial killer that had been in the United States with 93 kills, 10 of them being in Mississippi. Um, two of those were in Jackson County, which is the county where I'm from. I'm, in sorry, I'm going to case, interrupt you there. For those that don't know, go Google Sam Little. Yes. And you will see that. And they, I guess, captured him or he was behind bars and he started confessing. And it was, he's in prison, I think, up in New England. And it led to uh, and Darren and them actually uh, went and spoke to them. And it turned out that there were two or three in Jackson County that he had actually passed through there. So, yes, he did. Uh, and it, so in, in working that, in one of our victims in that case was Melinda Lupree, and I could not find out what happened to her remains. And so in studying that case, and this is kind of telling you how all this came about, what we're going to talk about today. In studying that case, uh, uh, my understanding was they were shipped to Oklahoma. Uh, she was decomped, and when she was found, she was shipped to Oklahoma uh, to Dr. Clyde Snows, who was a world-renowned anthropologist, to his lab. And so I called the lab up and speak to Angela Berg, who, uh, and this is going to be in 2010, 2011. Speak to Angela Berg, and uh, she says, um, I said, I'm looking for, you know, Melinda Lupree's remains. And so she's telling me, she says, well, what do you want to do with these other Mississippi cases? And I went, well, how many do you have? And she said, I have five. And I thought, you had five Mississippi cases? She said, yes. Uh, the oldest one being from 1977. And, you know, that, that took me back that why would – our cases from 1977 be there. So this is what we're gonna go over. <clears throat> and I'm gonna put a couple of them up here and then I'm gonna talk about each one of them. So Claire Birdlong was from Greenwood, Mississippi. And at some point she found her way down to Moss Point, Mississippi via, we believe, Sam Little. This is one of Sam Little's victims. Now she was found December 27th of 1977. And she was uh, shipped to Clyde Snow's office in 1978 where she remained. There can't, Nobody can really tell me why that she remained there all these years when she belonged to Mississippi. Uh, you know, I would think our crime lab should have had jurisdiction over that, or our coroner's office should have had jurisdiction over that. But nevertheless, in their notes, when they called law enforcement, law enforcement says, we don't want the remains back. You can destroy them or whatever. Dr. Clyde Snow, knowing that you couldn't destroy human remains, kept them for all these years. So <clears throat> in, in, that, finding five there, I thought, well, you know, who all did we use? We used quite a few different people. We used, um, of course, Dr. Clyde Snow. We used uh, Dr. Bass with the body farm. 
We used the uh, uh, several other different institutions, and we used a bunch of, um, which you're going to see here, a bunch of what I call rogue anthropologists. <clears throat> and so when I started looking around in reference to that, let me go back. I'm sorry. So in, in the 1977 case, um, Dr. Holabinka was able to get those remains back from Oklahoma and get them back into Mississippi. The 1991 case is Kimberly Funk. She was found in 1991, and she was actually at our coroner's office on a desk, uh, and I found her in 2012. So from 1991, DNA had already been in effect for quite a while, and we had, we had gotten good results with DNA. However, she remained on the desk at the coroner's office Nobody thought to send it to a lab to get it tested uh, until I called the coroner's office saying, do you have any boxes of remains? Yeah, I have two of them, two sets, two heads. And so uh, she said, do you want them? I said, sure. So I sent them to our crime lab, ultimately into NamUs, which y'all will hear more about that. And so we recovered, so not right now, I've recovered five from Oklahoma and two from our Jackson County coroner's office. None of these have been sent in for DNA at this point. Now we're up to 2012. So in, in Claire Birdlaw's case, the 1982 case with uh, Gary Simpson was also found in Jackson County, and he his remains were still at Dr. Clyde Snow's office. So we're getting all those back. And then the other one, uh, the 2001, is Reginald Garrett. Reginald Garrett was uh, found in Biloxi. Uh, he was a murder victim, and he was sent to... Um, Tulane, I believe it was, Tulane. I'm sorry. LSU. Sent to LSU where he remained there for up until he was brought back. Uh, these have been identified now because of the work that we have done. So in Jackson County, this is, this is um, the Kimberly Funk case, and this is one that we're fixing to identify um, that had been sitting on the coroner's desk for well, since 1991, hers, and 1992, his was found in vein clay. So these two sets of remains had, had remained there with nobody sending them to a crime lab or anything else to get any kind of identification on them uh, up until 2012 when I found them. Or called the coroner's office. She said, yeah, these two heads are here. They've fallen on the floor. The ears are broke off of them. Do you want them? And so... These then were sent to our crime lab, and, and I started realizing the problem that we have that, you know, how are we missing all the new technology when we're looking at these things every day when we walk into our office? So <clears throat> that was 2012 when those were found. In Stone County, um, this one was found in 1980. Now, we started looking for her early on, uh, myself and Christy Johnson. Christy Johnson ended up finding this one in Biloxi Police Department's uh, motor pool area where they do the work on their cars in a box. Um, again, I don't know how it got there. It's a Stone County case, but yet it was found in Biloxi. Uh, and this took a lot to, to try to locate that. Christy Johnson was really um, pivotal in a lot of uncovering a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> And we call her Miss Wiggins. And I think she is at the lab now. We probably uh, are going to be able to identify her shortly. So Dr. Ed Waldrop, and I want you to understand he was a doctor. Dr. Ed Waldrop was a Lamar County coroner at one point, And he's what I call a rogue anthropologist. And so what we found out through this investigation, through these cold cases, and this all started when I started this back in 2010. Um, we found out that he had we, we had, we had heard that he had had a couple of bodies and we had heard he had four in his attic. That was the story that came out. So we wondered how many he had. Three? No. That many? No. He is collecting this is the list that he supplied to Christy Johnson of the remains that he had his hands on at one time. There's 30 sets of human remains there that I started in 2012 trying to get him to return over back to Mississippi. And I went through the AG's office, I went through the DA's office, and nobody really wanted to mess with this thing for the 
for whatever reason. I don't, I guess, I don't know, really. But so in, in his sidekick is going to be this guy here, Dr. Michael West, Forest County Coroner. These are educated people. How many did he have? Well, I really don't know. We know he had some. And he tells me that he had some incinerated, which he knows should never have happened with human remains. And this is the, the uh, story that uh, Senator Wiggins was speaking of in reference to some of the things he did. And Lieutenant, I'll just add there for uh, the record, Dr. West has back in the early mid 2000s was banned by the Mississippi Supreme Court from testifying in cases in Mississippi. Um, I don't know if Lieutenant's gonna go into this, but he promoted a uh, dental exams or whatever you wanna call it that, that actually came out to be ruled as false and fake science, if you will. And the Mississippi Supreme Court said he can no longer testify in the state of Mississippi. And That's correct. Now, I went to a school up in Savannah, Georgia, where uh, it was a, a medical legal school and basically, when we got there, um, I was the only one from Mississippi. And somebody said, uh, is anybody here from Mississippi? And I'm, yeah. Raised my hand. They said, well, we're fixing to show you the embarrassment of Mississippi. And it was just the story of, of him and how he was finally caught and stopped. But he put himself out there as a tool mark expert and an odontologist, basically a bite mark expert. Now, he, he did work for our Pasco Police Department that he actually identified a bite mark on a rape victim only a rape suspect, only to have DNA, cancel that out and say, that's not your guy. You have the wrong guy. So, but this guy had some of our human remains as well. So <clears throat> in, in to, to cut this kind of short, there is one more case that I want to tell you about um, that led me really to try to be a solution for these kind of cases. And while I was working these cases, I had an individual call said, hey, look, there's a guy in prison in Texas. You need to look at this guy. He's responsible for some deaths probably here in Jackson County. Um, he uh, raped my daughter. Uh, and he's going into all this detail about this individual that came up missing and was friends with this man. And I went, okay, well, I'll look into it. And uh, so I look up the guy. Sure enough, he's in Texas for rape, for raping a child. And I've been working some of these cold cases was in reference to a child that had been kidnapped while she's walking home from school. Now he didn't have anything to do with that case, but the, the case that he believed the, the caller believed he had something to do with was somebody by the name of Becky Albright. And I told him, I know Becky Albright and Becky Albright didn't have anything. She's not missing. She's alive and well. He said, well, maybe it's her sister. And I said, okay. So I call, get a hold of family members and talk to Miss Lanny, who is uh, Melissa's mother. And I said, do you have a daughter missing? She said, yeah, Melissa's missing. And I said, okay, well, I've never heard of that. I didn't know, you know, I know Becky, I didn't know Melissa was missing. And, and so I'm sitting here talking to her and I'm getting the information, I'm writing it all down. And I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna work on this case. I know the family, you know, I'm kind of connected. And um, as I'm, talking to her, she said, you know, why are you calling? And I said, well, I'm, I'm interested in your case. She goes, you are the very first law enforcement officer that ever called me. And I went, she'd been missing since 1986. And I thought, how, how could nobody call about a missing person, you know, that happened in 1986 and here it is again, 2012, 2013. And the only law enforcement agency that called her was me. And I, you know, I wasn't even sure where she was missing from. Make a long story short, she ended up missing out of California, but she was a, a Pascagoulian. So, and I knew the family. And so, you know, I thought, well, Pascagoulian, I mean, California ain't got anything to do with us. I, you know, what am I going to do in California? So, you know, I, I realized that <laughs> I was the only one that ever talked to her in reference to this. And I said, I can either be part of the problem or I can be part of the solution. So we ended up calling Chula Vista, uh, California, and I sent everything, I did a report, sent everything that we had on the daughter. 
um, any information and the mother had reported her missing at least three times in San Diego, California, and nobody ever called her back. Nobody ever entered into the computer. Nobody did anything. That's a drop. Law enforcement dropped the ball there. So in getting the information sent to Chula Vista, I had a print card where she was a bartender in Pascagoula. We sent the print card in. And um, they had recovered a body in 1986, about two months, and the only thing that was survivable that they could get a print from was one finger, and that ended up being Melissa Albretton. And, um, and had they done the report, had law enforcement done the report, that would have been, those dots would have been connected back in 1986. They could have buried her. Instead, uh, Melissa was uh, cremated in a, in a mass grave of other unknowns, uh, and so the family never got to get her back home. But just to hear that family that now they know in all these years that it had bothered them and, and, that, um, and that some little detective from Pascagoula was able to help bring that closure, locked me into this forever. And so I started researching all these cases, bringing them to the crime lab's attention. She ends up, uh, Dr. Holobinka will tell you more about that, in getting all these sets of remains that were from all over. Um, and that we got to, that's got to stop. We can't have our corners giving away such remains or just sitting at them, looking at them in a drawer or in a box, uh, and not doing something with them. There needs to be some legislation that that puts us in control of the uh, uh, state medical examiner's office, so that we don't have this again. And, and as I said, Dr. Holobinka will speak more on that. But this is something that nobody knew and nobody was aware of, and. Um, and it's an issue and it's still going on today. So there's gonna to have to be some legislation to come into play to, 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 that we can bring these people back home and give them back to their families. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Dr. Holobinko. Good morning. My name is Anastasia Holobenko, and I am the state forensic anthropologist with the medical examiner's office. I've been with the medical examiner's office since 2016. Um, at first, say the first few years of my employment, I primarily worked cases and assisted with some administrative responsibilities. And then in 2021, um, I moved more into strict casework with a focus on cold cases and achieving identifications uh, for many of our unidentified cases. Uh, first, before we go into the unidentified person's uh, perspective of this, just missing persons reporting an investigation uh, challenges. Lieutenant Versage has already covered some of these, but there are inherent investigative difficulties with these types of cases. The cases can be very fluid. Some of them, some missing persons will be reported. And then the two days later, it's resolved because the person came home. So maybe that happens in a couple of days, maybe in a month. There's just a lot of fluidity. So that can affect the numbers and it makes it difficult to investigate these cases also individuals who engage in maybe high risk lifestyles or particularly vulnerable populations. And there are jurisdictional inconsistencies within the state. So there are 82 counties in a reservation and all of them have unique needs pertaining to these types of cases. So they will investigate accordingly, but we lack centralization and standardization of procedures that would provide some structure um, so that there is consistency within or between the jurisdictions, allowing jurisdictions to share information and to work these cases because they often cross jurisdictional lines. Another issue, limited resources, that would be financial resources, staffing, and we do lack some statutory language pertaining specifically 
to the investigation and reporting of these cases. Unidentified persons reporting and investigations. So Lieutenant Rasage has already given you the history of this uh, problem. We do have a historical lack of continuity in how these cases are reported, submitted, handled, and final disposition. And when I say unidentified persons, what I'm talking about, these are unidentified human remains, deceased remains that are not visually recognizable due to decomposition or traumatic injury. That would be visually unidentifiable and would require scientific identification methods to prove identity. So having a driver's license on an individual who is not recognizable, that's not scientific. That would be circumstantial. And that is something that can be done, but it is preferable to go the scientific route so we have confirmation. So before the establishment of the State Medical Examiner's Office in 2011, um, basically all of the counties in Mississippi were doing their own thing. And this did lead to outsourcing of cases to state agencies in other states, to individual practitioners, um, and outsourcing led to case files being completely destroyed, so there's no documentation. Uh, human remains were destroyed. Any kind of biometric information, like fingerprint cards, uh, those were destroyed or lost. And information of unidentified remains and also excessive embalming um, is a form of destructive handling. If you don't take samples for DNA before you embalm excessively, the tissue can be rendered, it's not viable anymore. So you can't get a positive ID, you can't do DNA. Individuals were buried in unmarked graves, unidentified and buried in unmarked graves. Um, Many of the cases already, as alluded to, were used by universities as teaching specimens for decades, literally decades, with no, ostensibly with no effort made to identify these individuals. And I would like to point out that this type of practice is different than what you find in med schools. In med schools, um, individuals donate their bodies or their next of kin donate their bodies. It's a documented legal practice. In this case, there was no donation, nothing. So this still happens today on some level. Um, it has improved slightly since the establishment of the medical examiner's office, but currently the current system makes it almost impossible to locate living missing persons um, because maybe the report isn't made or insufficient information is taken. Uh, in order to conduct a proper investigation. It's impossible to identify unidentified persons and return them to their families. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, we received an inquiry from a family whose loved one had uh, died in the 1980s. Um, we had little to no information on this case. The family wanted the remains of their loved one and uh, apparently a homicide victim that there were conflicting dates of death on the death certificate and no case file, no location of the human remains. And this was a case that was handled by Dr. Stephen Hain, Michael West, and Ed Waldrop. So we're not sure. We have to do more research into this. We just got the inquiry, but this is a significant problem on many levels. And part of the problem is that skeletal remains aren't necessarily viewed as people, because when they don't have the soft tissue, you know, it just doesn't look like somebody. So this has been a contributing factor. Uh, this makes it difficult to pursue justice in the criminal courts. And uh, you can imagine chain of custody is a nightmare on these cases. So the solution I would offer would be the better utilization of the resources we already have and create new resources. This, um, this slide is an example of the 18 identifications that the State Medical Examiner's Office, MBI, and uh, an informal kind of task force composed of individuals from multiple agencies. Lieutenant Rasaja is a member, Christy Johnson, and others. 
Um, we've been able to achieve 18 identifications over the last two, three years. And this is a joint effort. These are existing resources that are underutilized. And I will say the, the cases that have a red star uh, marking them, most of these were individuals whose remains were recovered from outside institutions. And the one on the top left, this would be Clara Birdlong. This was the 1977 case that Lieutenant Versage had mentioned. So just brief statistics on missing and unidentified persons. NamUs is the national missing and unidentified persons system. This is a national clearinghouse for case information pertaining to missing and unidentified persons. Um, so uh, case information can be uploaded, biometrics can be uploaded, DNA samples can be submitted and uh, analyzed for free. This is a, a valuable resource that is not utilized enough. Uh, we use it frequently. It will become necessary to use this due to federally um, passed legislation. This was last year, it's called Billy's Law. Billy's Law will require the entering of these cases into NamUs. And it also requires the communication between NamUs and NCIC, uh, another database um, for entering these types of cases. Uh, communication between those two databases so that information can be kept current and accurate. Nationally, missing persons, we have about 24,000 missing persons at any given time. Uh, the average age a person remains missing is about 19 years. Unidentified persons nationally, it's about 14,005, and the average age a person remains unidentified is 22 years. Now, state statistics, uh, they vary widely depending on which source you consult. So for instance, NCIC, which should be a pretty reputable database, and it is a reputable database, but it's only as good as the information that's entered into it. They list 1,500, almost 1,600 missing persons. Um, NamUs, 177 missing persons. And then there is a, a publicly sourced website, Mississippi Missing and Unidentified, that has about 280 plus. But you'll see that in the unidentified persons uh, numbers, it looks like the 280 plus could be a combination of missing and unidentified persons. Um, NCIC shows 19 unidentified persons. Um, NamUs shows 59. And there is an asterisk by there, by that number, because I just updated NamUs. So I am well aware that we have more than 59 unidentified individuals. That would be in our custody. I'm not really sure how many others remain unidentified that might be at universities and other agencies. So a problem with this is that there are no standardized procedures, there's no reliable database, and if you don't have reliable information on a state level, you're not going to have it on the federal level. So our recommendation would be to, um, our, our informal task force has, has done well, it's been effective, but our recommendation would be to formalize that, perhaps in the form of a missing persons unit um, overseen by MBI. This would be similar to their, their tra uh, human trafficking unit. And it would be a federal task force structure, um, several agents to handle all jurisdictions throughout the state because these cases cross not only state jurisdictional lines within the state, but they cross state lines. And this would be a combination of uh, law enforcement experts, scientific experts, um, utilization of a database that would allow, a state database that would allow in closure of the information gap that currently exists. Uh, this would also facilitate compliance with that federal law. So this would require some legislative changes. Um, the Missing Persons Act would need to be legislated. 
Um, it would also include some reporting and investigative guidelines. Uh, there's, we would need to amend the state medical examiner statutes in accordance with our current administrative code. This basically pertains to how unidentified human remains are handled, um, how they're stored, how they're reported, et cetera. And the benefit would be to clarify some of the vague statutory language and allow better utilization of resources and coordination of activities as they pertain to these cases, because there are many stakeholders involved uh, in these cases. Um, you've got law enforcement agencies, you've got, um, uh, of course, coroners, you've got universities, you've got uh, individual practitioners. So we need to have some centralization and standardization of procedure in order to help the individual jurisdictions work these cases how they need to. So just to recap, um, legislate creation of an MBI missing persons unit, amend statutes to address the handling of unidentified human remains, missing and unidentified persons reporting and investigations guidelines, and improve our system so that these types of cases are handled promptly, proactively, and with the dignity and respect that they all deserve. Well, there was one last slide, um, but just kind of a visual to uh, remind you that bones are people too. You want me to flip through? <laughs> Bones are people too. So this is an actual anthropologist with his dog. Um, dog passed away first and then he passed away and it was his wish that their skeletons be displayed at the Smithsonian Institute. Huh. So the next time you think of skeletons or bones, just remember that they are people, just in a different form. Thank you, Dr. Holubinko. Thank you. Um, while Sheriff Peterson is getting up here, I just wanted to say, um, in, a, in a matter of coincidence, I guess, but uh, started preparing for this, and it turned out that um, our colleague, one of our colleagues on the House side was working with Sheriff Peterson and a couple of others on this issue. And so when we were putting this together, Sheriff Peterson and uh, Representative Felcher had, was doing it, called me and said, hey, this is great. Do you mind if he comes? I said, heck no. So Sheriff Peterson from Harrison County, who is about, is retiring as of January. So he's glad to have turned over the duties to his successor. <laughs> And Sheriff, we appreciate what you've done in law enforcement and hope you have a good post career, but appreciate you taking this time to come and talk to us about this. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Absolutely, thank y'all for having me today. Um, the, let me, I'm gonna take it, let me just tell you a little bit of my background. I've got, I'll be retiring in January and, and I'm happy to retire, but I'll have, I'll have 31 years in law enforcement. And, when I say that, you know, some people can say, well, I've done a lot in law enforcement. I've done everything in law enforcement. Everything that you can imagine, I have done. I've been there and done it. Um, and it's been a very fruitful career for me. I, I, I love this job, and it's very bittersweet for me to leave, but it's, uh, I think it's time for me to go find something else to do. But this came to me, uh, talking about um, bones and, and recovery of bones, it came to me just months ago. And since then, I have spoken to judges, I've spoken to prosecutors, I've spoken to district attorneys and other sheriffs, police chiefs. Nobody knew this law was not in effect. None of us did. So in 31 years, none of us had any clue that there was nothing, that there was no standardized procedures for collecting, collecting the bodies. So just to put it in perspective, for y'all to make you understand from a, from a law enforcement standpoint, um, we find them all the time through the state. You'll hear about it on the news where as soon as hunting season starts, a county will find a body in the woods. Happens every year. 
the collection process of that body, when, when law enforcement is contacted first, we go out. Um, we, we start conducting a report at that time. If it's to the point where uh, there's, there's nothing on the body but just bones, there's really nothing to recover evidentiary wise in the area. You know, the tire tracks are gone. Uh, whatever may be there is gone through the elements of the weather. So we collect what's there around the body. That means clothing, anything we can find. At that point in time, the coroner takes the body. So we take most of the evidence to work it on our end. Now, the difference between smaller counties and larger counties is, is Harrison County, uh, and hopefully my board won't be watching this, but we have the resources and the funds to, to work these cases. And I would take it away from my investigators by saying, I want y'all to hand this to somebody else to work because they enjoy this. Smaller counties can't do that. So they have to rely on MBI and the state crime lab and everybody else to come in to help do this. But we enjoy working these cases and we have the funding to do it. But the coroner comes in, takes over the case. They take the body at that point. From that point forward, there's nothing in statute that says where that body goes or what happens to those bones. And that's what we're trying to discuss today to y'all to make you understand that you have to put yourself in the perspective of a family member. <clears throat> so if you, have a, if you have a family member that's missing, you have to put your, yourself in that person's shoes saying, where's my family member? Well, you're, you're having holidays. You're going through your life every day and your family member is not, is not, can't be found. When in reality, they're sitting on a shelf in somebody's office. That's the reality of it. We had a case that, and they, they both spoke about Christy, and Christy worked for me, so I'll take the, I'll take the, the claim for her being good. She, um, she did a, she worked a case to where our previous coroner, um, she was trying to locate a body and couldn't locate it. This was a missing female for, for years, years past. She found the body on Seaway Road in a storage facility. And that's where she located the body. So if there's, if there's a standard practice, you know, the, the biggest thing that I'm, oops, sorry, the biggest thing that I'm told every day in law enforcement is transparency. And it's something that we have to be transparent when it comes to human remains, because it is a human. Just like the doctor said, you see it in a different perspective because you're looking at, at, in, at a bone, you know, at bones. And, and again, when we go into the woods to get these bones, you may find a bone here and one 30 feet away because the, the, the animals and the elements have got to them. So, so we're looking everywhere for different, different bones. And it's rare that you're going to put a whole person together if it's a long history of somebody being in the woods, but we collect what we find. But there has to be something in the legislation that says where these bones go. If, if the state medical examiner's offices or their office is where they need to go, then that's where they need to go. They don't need to be in a storage unit. They don't need to be in somebody's trunk which was proven in Hancock County. Um, the last corner there, when we did the search warrant on his, his stuff, we found actual human remains in the trunk of his car. Chair, not, can, speaking of Christy, I think Dollar, Dr. Holobinka was talking about a case y'all just got yesterday. Is that right? The, can you tell him about that? Because this just happened yesterday. You know which one I'm talking about? I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> well, when you, I'll let you get back up, but they just had another case yesterday where the victim family contacted them and it's they're like where's my family member but i'll let dr holobinko talk about that later. Uh, yeah i don't know about that one but uh but it just you, you, it goes back to um the lack of i hate to say lack of respect for but it it, it goes back in that direction because you're you're taking somebody that is a is an aunt an uncle uh, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother uh, that is sitting on a shelf somewhere when they could be in the state's, in the state's property and the proper procedures and the proper testing could go on. There's not a lot of counties in the state that can afford to do genetic genealogy or, or forensic testing on bones and materials and bones. Um, so we would rather the state do it. We would rather them, them have the bill for that. And quite certain as a law enforcement officer, I would rather y'all have the responsibility. I don't want to keep those bones. I don't want to have that burden 
of knowing that somebody's in my vault and us not know us not knowing who that person is. I would rather get that out of my vault. Well, Sheriff, while you're there, I'm going to ask this question because this is one of the ones I was going to ask, but I'll go ahead and do it now. So to your point, I think what we tend to hear and what we will hear is quote, the quote local control. This is local. This is local. This is local. And if you're a coroner, you know, you're taking that away from us. So what is y'all, what is the response to, to that, that, well, the state would be telling them how to do this? Well, the coroner, and I'll say it from this, and I'd rather, I'd rather her answer it more than me, but he, he or she that is a coroner is not, doesn't have the qualifications that she has. And I'll put it, I'll put it in that perspective. Um, I, I, as a 31-year career law enforcement officer, am not a forensic analyst. I'm not a fingerprint analyst. I, and I'll tell you real quick, if we get to a certain place in a case, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't know anything about that. Um, so I think that their level of expertise needs to go to that level, and it, and it needs to go to the next level after that. So if, if, they, can, if, if they can collect, if they can uh, preserve and... Um, the next step would be the chain of custody. So the, the biggest thing would be is collect and preserve, box, and then the chain of custody would go to the state. That'd be my answer to it. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have one question and then I'm gonna turn it over to the committee. Lieutenant, um, can you tell the committee about the recent Tennessee law that was passed? Can I tell? Yeah, just to, because in your packet, what you have is you have versions of state laws that have been passed uh, across the country, um, along with the uh, federal law that Dr. Hullabinko talked about. But I think the most talking to the lieutenant, uh, Tennessee was the most recent. If you look at also uh, your page, the one that's kind of the spreadsheet, it lists the different states with Tennessee at the top. Uh, about what they have done. So can you tell the committee about the Tennessee law, what they did? I can go on a specific case. Uh, so Tennessee law, to begin with, Mississippi isn't the only one doing this. A lot of states are, are, uh, have changed the way they do things now because of this has been going on in every state. It ain't just Mississippi. So, But we've not corrected ours. We need to do that. But in Tennessee, Tennessee has what's called the body farm. The body farm educates law enforcement on the decomposition over – time whether they're buried in the water and there's there's all oh, it's, it's a great school there's there's no doubt it does educate us but he was an anthropologist or he is an anthropologist uh, dr bass was and william bass i believe his name is and um in in the stories that i've uh, dug up and in, in, in reference to bringing this to a point is that um there were some bodies that he had collected over the years just such as dr ed walter has and and, and as uh, michael west and as Dr. Haynes has collected these human remains. And so some of these were buried uh, on the body farm for educational purposes. And so what happened is when law enforcement got to looking at this and discovering what I've discovered here now, they discovered in Tennessee, they go back to him and say, look, we need, need these bodies back. Nope, not going to do it. He wasn't refused, but basically says, the law doesn't say I got to, I'm not going to. And so they retroactive that law back and the very first one that they dug up was a homicide victim they had been looking for. So um, that, that's our case is that some of these cases, they're in boxes, they're in attics. They are, you know, the things that we have uh, heard and, and that and, and props for Halloween. I mean, you know, y'all have read articles where they've been found in fairs and, you know, spook houses and stuff such as that. Um, but I can show you firsthand Mississippi has this problem and and it needs to be centralized with our, our our crime lab needs to have custody of all these so you got one central place the problem with corners is a corner four-year term he's out another one comes in doesn't know anything about the body doesn't know anything about a box with a skull in it and then that corner leaves another one comes in or an assistant comes in and nobody can locate the set of remains after years and years and years and so Having each individual 82 county corners, I know some corners work more than one county, but but having 
having these bodies all over the place isn't going to solve anything. Coroners are going to leave and come. And investigators are going to leave and forget about cases. And 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 so if you've got them centralized in one place, then they're always there until we were till we identified them and sent them home to their family. There is no better. In law enforcement, I have arrested murderers, a rapist. I have put people behind bars for drug dealing, giving kids drugs, and I've had a lot of satisfaction in my career. But the best satisfaction I have ever had is bringing a loved one home back to their family. There is no, there is no comparison because you, you, you feel and you hear the hurt that they've had for so many years. We are technically not... We're not connected like we should be. Someone dies in California, none of y'all think about that. They only bat an eye. But if it's y'all's loved ones, you certainly feel the pain there. And so we have disconnect. And I'm, I won't, our point is to try to connect y'all to, to the problem that we see here. And we're either part of the problem or part of the solution. And I just choose to be the solution. Our Calabico chooses to be the solution. So, uh, but that's, that's what I know about that Tennessee law. I don't know all the particulars in reference to that, but, but that's pretty much it. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the committee for questions. Anybody? Senator DeBar. This is for Dr. Halobinko, if you don't mind. So how many cases are where there are uh, remains unidentified throughout our state? Is there a large number of cases or or remains that you're aware of? I don't know. I'm aware of approximately 60 that we have in our custody or that would be um, buried and would require exhumation. So we recently were involved in the exhumation of four cases. These are all on the coast. Um, so there's at least 60 that I'm aware of, which means there's going to be considerably more right and I, I think i kind of agree that we need one location as a central repository for these remains mm -hmm. is the crime lab large enough to accommodate the remains that are that you're aware of and, and future remains as they come th come to your office so the state med so this is um this really pertains to the state medical examiner's office so you know we're co-located with the crime lab um, and we share archival storage, which is quite large. And this is where we're currently curating um, the remains. It's sufficient for our needs um, even more so. Um, so this would pertain to just state medical examiner, uh, basically jurisdiction or custody over these cases. The crime lab would handle certain scientific analyses, but they would not be responsible for the curation of the remains. Um, and I, I would also say uh, to your question about um, the, uh, the need to have this centralized, we have found with our efforts to ID these individuals that many of them resided in other states. And local jurisdictions, you know, maybe Harrison County has the resources to to go across state lines and work with other investigators, um, but most jurisdictions don't. And uh, that's where the state resources would assist. So we don't wanna take over anybody's investigation. That's not what the intent is. We are just trying to establish some structure that would allow every county to investigate according to their needs, but to provide them the structure, just the framework in order to be more effective. So currently, I'm from a rural area, probably my corners, I not, don't have the resources that Harrison County or somebody may have. If a body, if remains are found, do they ship them somewhere to have the DNA tested or do they do it themselves or how does that work in every set today? So, any death, that would be considered a medical legal death or forensically significant uh, would be a coroner case. And if a person is unidentified, that is forensically significant. So if, a, if they can't get fingerprints like on scene or within a day, 
um, that body should be sent to our office really regardless. If it's forensic forensically significant and um, in need of identification or is mandated for autopsy, uh, the body should come to us. And many times we do get remains or, or bodies that are sent to us that are not specifically mandated in the statutes because the statutes mandate infants and um, homicide uh, in custody deaths. Those are the only mandated, actually not even homicides, in custody and infant. Those are the only two mandated autopsies. So that, that's another issue. Um, so they should be sent to us. And I would say since the medical examiner's office was implemented, uh, that has improved and we are getting a considerable number, uh, but, but not all. But Senator DeBar, I will piggyback on her answer to, and I think she's being nice, I think, to your question. And I'm not saying this is George County or Greene County by any means, but if they're found, it's left up to 82 different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And so in one county, they may send it to the crime lab. In another county, that coroner may take them home and keep them. In another county, uh, they may ship them somewhere or sell them on the black market or something. Is that, am I accurate y'all in answering that question? Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> okay, as far as corners now, I know y'all have. You know, well, the, Lieutenant, his question was, how does it happen now? Because as he's saying in, in Georgia and Green County, only because that's where his representation is, they may not have the resources. But what happens now when these remains are found? All right. Well, um, can I go with my thought and then I'll, I'll get that? All right. So um, basically, corners, you know, the, the their education level is a high school graduate or equivalent. That's a corner. That's a corner. He has a, a tremendous amount of power uh, over these human remains that, you know, for the life of me, I don't understand why there's not more of an education level in reference to that. But, but regardless of that, um, you know, corners, you can read news article after news article about corners that have taken the bodies and sold them on the black market, as you're, as you're talking about. Um, so with coroners, I don't know how they could ever identify anybody anyway. They don't even have an NCIC uh, database that they can pull up in their, in their office. They don't, they don't have that technology. They don't have anything that they can search missing people through NCIC to see if there's somebody that's missing. They don't have any of that. They're, they have to rely on law enforcement to do that. So while they're having all the jurisdiction over these human remains um, and not giving them to somebody that can have NCIC run on them or do the, the, the medical examination on them is beyond me why, we, why we're even, why we're even dis, disputing this or debating this. So it is happening because I, I've talked recently with a, with a case where they found human remains and the coroner wanted to keep them in house. They didn't want to send them to the crime lab. What are they going to do with them? I don't know, but the investigator wanted to really stick to that. And um, I don't know what they can do. I don't know what their education level even is. Well, and part of that, if I may, is what you're recommending is that any such remains be entered into NamUs. Am I, so that, I, yeah. that, when you cut it down, that's it. So those remains be entered into NamUs so that you can track those bodies, people, whoever. I mean, that's the bottom line because that's not required right now. Is that correct? It's not required. No, it, it should be. It, our coroners should have, if, if they're going to accept the jurisdiction of this, and I, I am not for that. I'm just telling you, I think I think all the human remains should go to, to the state crime lab for them to do the analysis that need to be done. A coroner cannot do anything but the paperwork in reference to that. Now, I'm not knocking all coroners. There's some good coroners out there, but there are some out there that are for – obvious reasons. Dr. Haynes was a doctor. You see what some of the, you can Google some of the stuff he did. Dr. West was a doctor, an educated man, but still he decides he wants to destroy the remains that he has because nobody wanted them. Uh, and and um, Dr. Walter, Walter having so many sets of remains for years, he is an anthropologist, a trained anthropologist that is supposed to help identify these people that just kept them as trophies. Now he, he has a, a 
Southern Institute of Forensic Science, which he goes around and teaches law enforcement, and these were his props. That's why he had so many of them. And basically what he would do is farm his services out to law enforcement, say, hey, I know there's not an anthropologist for the state. You call me in, I'll do it free of charge. Just let me have the body. And coroners who are on a budget, what do they do? Hmm. Well, I ain't got to pay for that. That remained to be uh, buried. So I just give them to this guy. Who cares? Who knows? They're just a shell. And so that's, that's what we're talking about here. But it's still happening today. Uh, Senator Baird. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think it's a great idea, what you're saying. Uh, but for the last three, four years, uh, we've been hearing how the, the state crime lab and the medical examiner's office is backlogged. And that's why cases weren't moving to trial. Would this have any effect on putting more of a burden on the state crime lab or the medical examiner's office causing crime, uh, excuse me, cases and medical examinations and autopsies to be delayed further? So as far as the crime lab, I can't really speak to their caseload or backlog. Um, I will say with the medical examiner's office, our backlog of uh, final autopsy reports when I say a backlog, that means that the autopsy has been completed, but the report was not issued. And so that has been all but eliminated. There may be just maybe less than 100 cases that are outstanding as opposed to a couple of thousand. So as we, we do get skeletal remains cases. And it's not like we don't get any and then the coroners are sending them all over the place or keeping them. Um, there are some who will keep the remains or send them to a university or somewhere else instead of the state medical examiner's office. Um, it's inherent in an anthropology exam that it's not a quick exam because if the bones come in skeletal, they're all bones, there's no soft tissue, then I don't really have to do much except look at the bones and analyze them. And that's a lengthy process. If the bones come in like that, the body, um, I can, it might take me days, weeks to do a proper analysis to develop a biological profile, measuring bones to determine stature, taking other measurements to um, estimate someone's sex, biological sex and their age. It's, it's not quick. Um, but that's built in to an anthropology exam. If they come in with soft tissue, then I have to prepare the bones so that they are just bones. And then that adds more time. So you're not going to get a set of skeletal remains turned around in two days. It's just the way that it is. But do I anticipate that it would create a tremendous backlog for our office or for me? No. I mean, I'm, I already have, you know, a significant caseload, but I would say much of my time is spent on these cold cases trying to identify people. So there may be complaints that my turnaround time is not what it would, what they would like it to be, but we've achieved 18 identifications of people over the last couple of years. So I think it's just something that has to be done, you know? So no, I don't anticipate that it would skyrocket the backlog or anything. Yeah, yeah you sure. Are, you are correct when you talk about the crime lab, but what this, what you, and I understand you're seeing this already, but what this does is centralizes the location where the bodies are going. So I would rather them be at the crime lab and they can be worked when they can be worked. We already have, from a law enforcement standpoint, we've already done everything we can do at that point. So they have, it's, it's their ball at that time. So I would rather it be there in storage than somewhere else in storage where it's gonna be lost, translation. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and maybe in my mind, I just can't, uh, I guess, make a distinction in the crime lab and the medical examiner's office. So, so that's probably my disconnect. Um, no, you're you're correct. You're 100 percent because we 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 were behind a lot of cases when it comes to uh, crime lab cases, and they were and they were holding us up in trials. But this would be something just like she just said. This would be something that if if it's if it's worked, it's going to take them a long time to work that one single case. 
but the biggest issue with it, it's there. It's in a centralized location sure. where we know where it's at. Sure. Yeah, my got it. Thank you. Senator Barrett, I'll just piggyback on that. Two things. Um, actually, just last week, Commissioner Tyndall was on the news talking about it. He was actually out there because he said this to uh, uh, correct the record because during the recent election season, people put that out there that there was a backlog. And he said that's not the case that actually with the work of this le of the legislature through funding and through that, along with him running that, that they actually don't have that. And I don't know that you hear over the years, we have, we meaning the legislature and DPS have installed a medical examiner in North Mississippi, South Mississippi, and there, which has helped tremendously. You brought in good people. And so to your question about the difference Maybe Senator uh, Pro Tem Kirby can give you the history, but the medical examiner history in this state has been very interesting, right, Senator Kirby? <laughs> and as they said in 2012, the legislature put the medical exam, which is different from the crime lab. Crime lab is where they do the analysis. The medical examiner is the one who does the forensic exams. And so if I'm hearing what they're saying, what their proposal is that within the ME office that is under DPS, they would be, for lack of a better term, the repository. And, uh, but the ME's, the ME's office is the one who oversees that, that testifies and does, does all that. So I hope that helps a little bit. Well, the thing I wanted to mention is in reference to these skeletal remains or even, even uh, uh, remains of staff flesh on them, um, you know, once once they are in the crime lab, the the evidentiary uh, value is preserved at that point. If someone is stabbed or they're killed with a particular tool that we have a suspect in custody that has that tool, that's going to be very valuable as far as comparing that tool mark to the stab wound or whatever. If you got these things as props in Halloween's and they've got knives stuck in them, you lose that. You lose every bit of that. And that's happened. So that, that's our whole point. Centralized evidence is, is secure. We, it, it's just going to be a better process all the way around than what we've been doing. Let's be part of the solution and not the problem. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Senator DeBar. Then we'll, uh, this will be the last question because we have one other. Just one question about the NamUs database that somebody can answer for me. Is that kind of like NCIC where it's a secure database that, only law enforcement and has access to, or how is who operates that and who has access to You're it? You're talking about NamUs? Yes. All right, so some of it is restricted for law enforcement purposes, but if a person has a missing relative, they can call, uh, they can actually put their missing relative into this system that we may be able to identify that away. Um, so there is access to the public, but there are certain things that are restricted only for law enforcement only. And and um, and that will not be accessed by the public. You can't access that. Part. Do our, our our coroners throughout the state do they have access to this database currently? Do you are you aware? I can only speak for Jackson County. When I talked to them about the Namus program, they didn't really know what the Namus program is. So some of us do not. Some of us in law enforcement don't even know what it is. Is it something the coroners should have access to? Yes, and they can. They can have access to it. Yeah. A free access website, or is that something we have to appropriate extra money for? How is that going to work? I don't. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. It's free. Is it free? Yeah. Okay. It's, free. it's not going to cost us. That's what we like to hear as well. That's, we're good with that too. All right. Thank you. And Senator, there's in your packet is uh, it's the legislation on the federal side where the federal government uh, has funded the NamUs program. So as I understand it, the feds have funded the NamUs to allow this to get well off the ground and to do that. And so now, as I understand, is to, as a state on these missing persons so that it can be put into the database so that this can be assessed. Right now, I don't see there any funding that would be required on, for the NamUs part of it. Um, I want to thank y'all for being here. I think this has been a excellent, it's been interesting. <laughs> and I think that 
it's certainly something that we need this committee needs to consider. I think we certainly will be doing that. And uh, thank you all for if you uh, I'm sure y'all will wait around. We have one other item to take up, but if y'all are w willing to just hang around, there may be some questions afterwards and all that. Um, okay, so for the benefit of the committee, I'm going to take up uh, number two, judicial redistricting. And the reason, there's a number of reasons this is on, but I'll just kind of highlight that and then open it up to questions from the committee. So as many of you have probably heard, judicial redistricting is coming up this session. Um, what you have in your packet, well, let me back up. There's a, as so much in our business, a lot gets discussed and a lot of it not necessarily based in what the law is. So what you have in your packet is you first have the uh, two legal provisions, the constitution and the statutes. So, and some of you may already know this, but for the benefit of the audience and all, section 152 of the constitution uh, says, well, and let me back up. People are asking, why are we doing it now? Section 152 of the, of the Constitution says, the legislature shall redistrict circuit and cha chancery court districts by December 31st of the fifth year following the census. Okay. Um, actually, and it goes on to say that if the legislature doesn't do it, then the sub chief justice does it. Um, we would like to do that. Uh, with his input or their input. Um, and uh, so the fifth year and judicial elections are up in 20, start in 2026 to take office in 2027. So if we get it passed this year, any candidates will have a year's, they'll know what the districts are. So we have to do it. That's why we have to do it. And then if you look at your the other statutes, um, Mississippi Code Section 953, Mississippi Code Section 973, um, each one, they're, the, they're basically the same, but one is dealing with chantry courts and one is dealing with circuit courts. And if you look at that under the section, they it says... The number of judges shall be shall be determined by the legislature based upon the following criteria. And then it lists that. And by the way, this is the law that's been in place for many years. Population, number of cases, caseload, geographic area and analysis, any other appropriate criteria. So the law says population, number of cases as the first two. Um, I think it's safe to say that preferences uh, and political and otherwise tend to uh, play a part and that's fine. That can be filed under any other appropriate criteria, but having worked with the Lieutenant governor's office uh, we're going to follow the law and look at that. So to that end, um, what you have in your packet is, let me see here. Should be Okay, if you look at your packet, and we asked, um, it should be at the end of your packet in the spreadsheet. Um, and is what we have asked Peer to put together along with, and, and Peer has, they can get information everywhere. Uh, in the counties, and listed by district and the civil cases and criminal cases and counts disposed and population and all of that. So I know many of your districts have that and others. So I presenting this to you um, to look at, to get with your folks back home um, and uh, talk to them. We have gotten other information. And by the way, the law says that AO, the, the administrative office of courts is required to work with us to provide information uh, on this. So we've gotten data from there and that's the data that we're going to be looking at and all of this. What I have heard to this point is that the data that's there, you know, may not be accurate or that. So what I'm asking is 
feel free to talk to your representative. I'm sorry, your judges, see what they say about it. And we have, when I say we, I'm talking uh, myself, Miss Pat, um, along with working with the Lieutenant Governor's office has sent out a letter and we set aside December 11th to meet with any senior judge if they so choose in person, if they want to, uh, I, uh, to talk to us about it. I, I file that under an analysis, I'm sorry, the geographic area and analysis of the needs by court personnel. And our letter went to the senior chancellor and senior circuit judge and any other appropriate criteria. So, and, and I say this in a good way, like I know Senator DeBar in representing his area, he's already brought forward data and some stu stuff to look at. So I think that's appropriate. Um, and so we've sent that letter, that's December 11th, that we set up a time, any member, you're welcome to be here if you want to. I'm not required, it's gonna, myself along with uh, uh, Ethan, and just it's really more to listen to see what they have and to submit any information that is relevant that they feel is relevant to that. I will note, and I think it cannot be ignored, that the population shifts have occurred in the state of Mississippi. And Chairman <laughs> Pro Tem. Uh, Kirby was chairman of redistricting. And the fact of the matter is population shifts have occurred along with caseloads and case data, which comes along with it. There's also other stuff that you look at that I think our officers here are certainly our Lieutenant can justify. There is, it takes more resources to investigate and prosecute a murder case than it does a, uh, you know, a trespass or burglary case. And so all of that, that, that's why I think the law says what it says. Uh, I will tell you, I've also heard um, in speaking like people with, with or, or conversation with Senator DeBar about your rural counties, that it's a long, that either they feel like they are not being heard or they feel like it's a long way <laughs> uh, to get from one place to the other in the district. Uh, also, um, that, but a cost is a factor too. And how are we going to fund this? Uh, last year we did the legislature with everybody's vote. We, we did some redistricting. We added, I'm sorry, we did, uh, we did assistant DAs, pardon me. Um, you know, there's a cost that's associated with all of this. Um, and so these are all the factors that I, that we need to be looking at if we're going to do it right. And um, I think uh, in speaking with the Lieutenant Governor's Office, we have a duty to look at it that way. Um, the Senate is ahead of the game on this. Uh, the House, obviously, as we know, is going to have a new uh, a leader and there's going to be that. But but uh, we're we're taking this on because that's what we do. And with uh and uh, Senator uh, Kirby led the redistricting. And I mean, you know, these are all factors. So where we are is to, I, I'm asking the committee and say, hey, go back, talk to them, see what we say. We're having these meetings set up. We may even, it looks like we're gonna have another meeting either certainly after December 11th, if people wanna meet in person. Let me reiterate, they don't have to meet in person. They can send information to myself and to Pat um, about caseload, whatever they want. Just we want to get the information to do that. And then as far as the members are concerned, if you have questions, you can speak with me and how, how those things are handled. So um, one other thing, let's see. Uh, oh, Hand in, hand in hand with the circuit court is your DAs. I've had questions from DAs. Um, it, it, we, had, we added 14 assistant DAs last year and funded those going forward. Um, we made a, we said that we were gonna look at that this year. I'm not, I'm not making any promises but it's certainly on the table. And if you are looking at circuit court districts, I think it makes sense that you're looking at, at DAs and prosecutors. 
Um, and I've had, I'll say this because I've had this question. There is no plan right now. If there is a plan, the plan is what's already there. Okay. So there is no plan at this stage, but we have, we have to do our diligence and, and I've been willing to say that we have to look at it because of the things that are in the law, which is the population, the caseload and all of that. So with that, I appreciate you listening to me. And if there's any questions, I'll open it up to the committee about that. No. Well, I want to thank y'all for doing, I, I don't know what's going to happen uh, in January. Uh, my assumption is the committee's not going to look a whole lot different. I'm only, that's me talking, but I appreciate everybody's work that we've had for four years, three and a half, four years. I think we've done a lot and I appreciate what y'all have done and your willingness to come and, and hear these things and do that. So thank you. And with that, uh, we're, we're adjourned. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Somebody. somebody on Zoom. Yeah, Senator Wiggins, this is um, Senator Boyd. Hey, the packets that you passed out there, um, are y'all going to put those, those of us who are not attending in person, are y'all going to email that information or are y'all going to put that in our mailboxes? No, you had to show up to get the packet, Senator <laughs> Boyd. So you're, yeah. Yes, we will, uh, we'll do that. Yes. Okay, and, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, thank y'all. Appreciate it. Look, I'm just, um,